Listen to the vibes hosted by Coyote Night. Listen in for some positivity and good times. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. Today, I'm privileged to have Mr. Tate Barber with me. Um, Tate and I went to uh, school together and grew up in the same town, and uh, our parents knew each other, and um, he's become very successful, and uh, I'm going to let him tell you all about how he got where he is right now. How are you doing, Mr. Tate? I'm doing great today, Kyle. Good. Thanks for having me on. I'm on it. <laughs> well, basically, let's just start off. We'll talk about uh, our little town that we grew up in, little Bay Town that um, has a little bit of uh, yeah. interesting history because uh, Gary Busey is from there. Um, if you recall a little movie, yeah. what was it called? The Hellfighters with John Wayne. That was uh, filmed in Pelly, which is basically yeah. a part of Bay Town. And uh, we've had quite a few football yeah. players come from there. Uh, our, one of our classmates, Mr. Quentin Corriott, who uh, went to Texas A&M and became a, a star in the NFL with the uh, Indianapolis Colts and ended his career with my favorite team, Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> so a little bit go. of history. So started off, Tate, let's talk about growing up in Baytown. Well, not to get away from the cinema, but – Keep in mind, RoboCop 2 was also filmed in Baytown. Did you know that? Yes, right there on Texas I mean, Avenue. That's right, RoboCop 2. Who didn't miss that one? <laughs> um, okay, so growing up in Baytown, wow. Uh, like, like most kids, uh, you know, you're, you're pretty – if it doesn't affect you and your little bubble, you don't really know what's going on. So growing up in Baytown, I, I mean, I thought everything was perfect. Uh, I do remember, you know – Sometimes you don't remember exact details about growing up, but you, you see the differences of kids growing up today versus growing up then. One thing that was a big deal for me, I remember when I was six years old, I got a bike for Christmas. And that summer, I was six. I mean, that's not very old. My, my mom used to let me ride from my house, which I lived in Eva Maud Plumwood by Bowie Elementary. She used to let me ride my bike from my house to this, this shopping center it was an outdoor shopping center called bay plaza and she would and there was a jack-in-the-box in the parking lot and mm -hmm. i could go she would let me ride my bike she'd give me like a two dollars and let me go ride my bike as a six-year-old to um jack-in-the-box to get lunch and eat lunch and i'd sit in there and i'd eat lunch and, and i'd ride my bike back and i remember you know thinking later on in my life like oh my god she'd be like arrested for that now no doubt but <laughs> no kidding in the 70s you know, that, that wasn't really a big deal. And uh, I think a, a lot of us grew up that way. Uh, kids were just given, afforded a little bit more um, leash and um, we just kind of learned from it. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the vivid memories of my childhood, just riding my bike. It was probably a mile and a half or two miles to a shopping center, putting the kickstand down and going in and ordering my two tacos for 99 or 59 cents back then and coke. So. <laughs> right do you remember the bay plaza theater used to be there well absolutely i spent many a uh, many a uh, day it's funny my wife actually she went to sterling she's a little bit older than us um she's two years older than us kyle and uh, she went to sterling and she grew up um in the general vicinity she moved later on but yeah i mean we oftentimes sit around and and she'll say things like you know the old movie will be on she was like oh, i saw that at the bay plaza or i saw that at the brunson hey, if it's really old i saw it at the brunson so i saw it you know you know one summer you know and if the movie was still making money they would keep it there does that mm -hmm. make sense you know stay longer and so I re i'll never forget you know raiders of the lost ark was a big movie and um for for day you know for days i think on the end we watched it once a day you know oh yeah so uh, the brunson was, was so cool. cool because they played cartoons before the movie started 
You remember that? That's true. They also had – I didn't know this. My, my wife told me this. I never did it. I think my parents were, like, real – we didn't do a lot. We didn't spend a lot of money for something. And, and um, I think that, like, on Saturdays, they had, like, a cartoon day. Like, you could go there – around noon on Saturdays and watch like it was like two hours of cartoons my wife talks about this all the time I, n- I never really got to do that it was but like it was, it, I think it was like two bucks you go in there and you could watch yeah. there cartoons you go. or whatever for a couple of hours and you know yeah uh, Bay Plaza the the one movie that I will never forget watching there was uh Grease <laughs> oh Greece. Yeah. Yes. I, I did see like um I did see one that um a really bad one. Um Xanadu. Oh Bay my Plaza. god. It's freaking brutal. brutal. Olivia Newton John. It's like a roller skating movie. Mm-hmm. Disco. Yeah, disco roller skating movie. And I and I also saw Flash Gordon and I thought that was terrible. Um, it was it was a classic all the Smokey and the Band and Mm-hmm. Nah, you know what? Just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, growing up just normal. Um, parents gave me a lot of freedom in junior high. I used to ride all over town on my bike. Oh, I mean, myself. It was nothing for me to ride to like over by our high school. There was a bike shop over there, and I would save my mowing money and ride over there and buy something for my bike. Um, it, it was crazy, you know. Um, I don't know. I enjoy it. And, and when I go back now, I, I look around and think, and, and by the way, I'm probably one of the few people, you know, most people migrate to a bigger city. I actually migrated to a smaller city. Oops. Um, I migrated to a smaller city. Um, I'm getting calls. And I'm oh, here on my no phone. problem, man. Um, Busy guy. To, Keep that in mind. Yeah. Folks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I moved to a smaller town. So I live in a town, Carthage, Texas. It's 6,600 people. It's about 24,000 in the county. Um, it's just simply because I wanted my kids to kind of grow up in this fashion and to have. Um, very uh, small town, East Texas, Bible Belt, very, you know, even us Methodists go to church on Wednesday night. Carthage, Texas, which you know, it's kind of fun. You know, it's like you know, only the Baptists go on Wednesday night. No, not here. Um, but it's a good thing. Um, you know, it's just it's just a slower pace. Um, uh, my father-in-law it was getting older, and he was living down in Baytown, and and we kept convincing him that you know he needed to move up here before he had to, before we had to take care of him, yeah. and. Uh, he didn't really want to move up here. We talked to him for about five years, and I think he's 80 now. And um, when he did move up here, it was probably about eight years ago, six years ago. He was like, oh, my God, so nice. Because, like, when he goes to the grocery store, it's small. You know, when, when he goes to the post – why would you go to the post office? But he does. He goes to the post office, and there's, like, no <laughs> line. And, you know, he's like – and I went down to – DMV the other day and I didn't have to wait to renew my driver's license. I'm like, I can you do that online. But, you know, for people that still kind of value that kind of thing, you know, it's, he, he likes it. He thinks, and I was like, oh, great. You just basically told us that we're, we're stuck in a time warp. So there's no traffic here. <laughs> you know? It's not a lot of traffic. So anyway. Oh, perfect. Um, I don't know. Growing up there, I thought it was good. Yeah. So you um, you um, have to keep a certain balance go between between business and family and spirituality. Um, how is that so much different? And it just seems to be mm-hmm. easier in a small town than in a bigger place. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I think really what it comes down to, and and we've even seen a lot of this. Uh, with our, you know, the pandemic that has hit our country. I think, um, you know, people ask me all the time, like, what's good about living there? Um, what's what's bad about living there? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, there's not a Starbucks on every corner here. People here still believe that coffee should be bought at a truck stop, but that's it. It's not, 
buy a barista for 450. I mean, it's just, you know, one of those right. deals. Um, I think like the sense of community, um, you know, obviously, you know, your neighbors and they know you. Um, I told my kids when they were really young, I said, you know, don't go out in public messing around because someone, whether it be one of my customers or, or someone we go to church with is going to come up to me and tell me what you were doing, jacking around or whatever. And, um, I think that's kind of the way it used to be, uh, even in Baytown. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it's kind of like you're, you're playing for, you're playing for a team, you know? And so when there's that as a kid, you're like, well, crap, I can't, you know, I can't let down, my family I can't let down my church I can't let down all those things you know it's bigger than yourself and I think that's what community is is just not being all about yourself I think sometimes the world tells us we should be all about ourselves and um, I don't necessarily agree with that you know I think sometimes things get a little easier when you're in them as a group you know when you're in them as a unit community um i have a friend who's in business here and he does really well he, he when his employees write emails he'll get a red pen he'll print them off he'll get a red pen and he'll he'll circle every time the person writes i and circle every time the person writes me so i and me mm -hmm. and then he always says the same thing over and he'll give them it back and he'll say I and me will get you out on a limb, but us and we will get you back in safely. And what he's trying to teach his, the people that work for him is, in this office, it's not an I thing or a me thing. It's an us and a we. From the owner of the business down to whoever, we, you know, we want it done like this, you know using those different pronouns because it gives people a sense of team and then we're all one unit working together for the common goal. So, I mean, you see a lot of that, I think more so here. Um, I can just compare my sister. She lives in Austin, mm -hmm. um, in Great Hills. And, you know, I think they know their neighbors, but it's not as, it's just not the same. You know, I think people are told to be a little bit more or they're not taught but it's inferred that, you know, you should keep to your own and that's nobody's business. And, mm -hmm. you know, and actually that nobody's business is probably true, but it's nobody's business if my kids are acting up at the store, but I certainly want to know. And if someone I know sees them acting up at the store and they tell me, well, it just goes to show them that, Hey, your community's watching you, you know, so don't let us down. Well, it's uh, it's good. Think. It's good that they look out for each other. That's the way it should be. I mean, I still remember. Depends on who you ask. That's true. But, you know, I still remember a time when our your neighbors, it, they would whoop your butt. And then when you got home, you got twice as much. <laughs> you know, it's not like that yeah. anymore. Yeah, I, I remember one, one of my first things. I had a friend over at our house and we were, we, there was an old lady that lived next door to me. And she was all, I mean, she was probably 70 or, but back then, I mean, we thought she was wretched, you know, mm -hmm. and we were kind of mean to her. We were little kids and we would yell stuff at her and run inside. And I remember getting in trouble for that. I really didn't understand why, you know, cause you're just a kid. You just, you know, I, I never understood that. But then later on, you know, you're like, Oh crap, we're being mean to some old lady. <laughs> There's nothing worse than that. <laughs> so, uh, so Just let's kid, ignorant youth type. Let's let's talk about like sure. your your education and um and how that's got you to where you're at right now. Well, um, I was a pretty good student in high school, as I do recall, um, <laughs> and I, I probably I probably could have been better, but I I, I graduated definitely in the top ten percent of our class. Uh, I don't think top five, but maybe close. Um, and I went back then that automatically got you into the university of Texas. And so my sister was going to university of Texas at the time. And my dad came to me one day and he said, where do you want to go to college? And I said, 
I guess I'll go to University of Texas. And so I did go. Um, I had a good time. Uh, the first them. two years especially, I had a really good time. I mean, like a really good time. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I had a real good time. I really felt like living in Baytown that, that I needed to get out and meet a lot of new people, you know, and so get in social settings. I really – uh, focused on that. Is that a good way to say it? Mm-hmm. And then about the time that I was, so that would be 19, 20, about the time I was going to turn 21, summer before I turned 21, I started realizing, mm, you know, you go to one of these parties, you've gone to a mall, and you can only drink so much beer, and, you know, it's fun and everything, but it's at some point this, this fantasy world that I was living in is going to end. I'm going to have to go out and get a job. So, um, I did really well my last two years of college. I mean, really well. And, and to all the parents I've been listening, you must remember uh, the adult brain, the frontal cortex of the adult brain is not fully developed until it gets about 20, 21, 22 years old. Therefore, they make generally bad decisions up to that point. And we're asking 18-year-old boys to go off to college and live like an adult and be self-sufficient and do all these things and act like an adult. but Generally, now there are exceptions to the rule, but generally, they're not really mature enough to do this. And I think I'm living proof of it. Now, once I matured, school got a lot easier for me. Uh, I didn't, I was more responsible and I did pretty darn well. I made the dean's list actually one time and and it's kind of funny. uh, Anyone that graduated from any university out there knows that, you know, part of the university's job is fundraising. And so um, they do a pretty good job of getting students, they they hire students uh, in the evenings to call their former, their alumni base and um, ask them to donate to the college that, you know, has made them so great or whatever. And so every time they call me and they call me about once every six months, they say, you know, Mr. Barber, this is so-and-so from the College of Liberal Arts. We'd love for you to donate to the College of Liberal Arts. And Generally, what I say is, you know, I would love to donate to the College of Liberal Arts, but y'all spent two years trying to kick me out of there and get me off campus. And now all you want to do is get my money now that I figured out a way to stay in and graduate. They don't think that's very funny. I think it's real funny. And that's all I always say. But I did graduate from the University of Texas. During that time, I did study abroad. Um, probably one of the cooler things I've ever done in my life. Uh, I didn't really want to do it, but I knew I could not pass Spanish three and Spanish four. So I, some guys I knew in my fraternity told me, you need to go abroad. It's really easy. Uh, and it's a really great experience. I went live in Cadiz, Spain, which is Ooh. about nine, 90 miles north of Gibraltar, uh, south of Portugal, north of Gibraltar on the Atlantic ocean. Um, I lived, uh, and with a family there, uh, most of the families that were housing American students, there was 20 of us. Most of them were doing it for the cultural experience. Uh, my family was doing it for the money. <laughs> and so uh-huh. they wouldn't feed us. They wouldn't, they wouldn't feed us. They wouldn't let us take hot showers. They wouldn't wash our clothes. It was a bad deal. So we lived with this, like, this horrible family. And uh, everybody else was doing these real nice families and nice house. And not us. We lived in, like, the, a tenement. You know, we like lived in a government housing project, but it's actually pretty cool. Um, you know, learned a lot there. Never had never been out of the country and uh, learned. I think everyone should, if they have an opportunity to do that, should do it because I wasn't a very good Spanish speaker when I got there. And uh, after spending several months there, I got to be a pretty darn good Spanish speaker. There was no English in that town. It's not like a big city like Madrid or Barcelona where you can find an American newspaper. You can hear English being spoken. There was zero English. And so I had to uh, survive, which was, it was just pretty neat. You know, you have to learn to speak the, the language. It was pretty cool. Uh, got, to saw, we got to go to Africa, got to go all around Europe. Uh, every weekend we'd go somewhere as a group. And it was, man, it was a good time. So uh, after I did that, um, we graduated from UT. Well, <laughs> I, I, funny, I, I'm a state farm agent now. That's what I do. I have a business here I had since 2000. Um, when I was in college, uh, after I got back from Spain, I was driving out by the hills of Austin, by Westlake, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I, I hit a deer, like a oh, deer, no. like cross, you know, you know where, um, you know, that mall is kind of at 360 and uh, 
Yes. There's a Barton Skyway right in there. Mm -hmm. um, I was driving back towards campus, and this deer ran. There's kind of a separated median. And the deer came out, and I hit, you know, hit my car. Not bad. Didn't pull the airbags or anything. Anyway, so ne that next day, I called my dad. I said, you're not going to believe this. I'm just driving down the road and hit this deer. And he's like, what? I go, what do I do? He goes, well, you have insurance, State Farm. So just go find a State Farm agent and ask them what to do. So, so the next day, I got up around campus. I drove to this guy's office, and I waited in there. And his phone was ringing, and he was the only guy in there. And uh, I'd just gotten back from Spain. I was only taking nine hours that semester to finish my degree, and uh, I needed a part-time job. And so the guy was sitting there, and he was trying to talk to me and help me set up a claim, and, and uh, he's struggling. He answered the phone. People were walking in. He couldn't get anything done. I said, hey, man, I'm looking for a part-time job. Do you need some help around here? And he was like, yeah, actually, I do. And so I got a job with him. And I worked there for about uh, six months and uh, watched him, and I go, well, I can do what this guy does. And I saw what he made. I was like, oh, that's pretty nice. And um, so I uh, decided I was going to be a safe farm agent. I went to work for the company. Of course, I just got back from Spain. I told them I spoke Spanish. I was kind of fluent at the time. Um, so they naturally, they moved me to San Antonio because <laughs> I spoke Spanish. And um, I worked there for two years, worked in Dallas for two, three years. Uh-oh. Here in this town, I've been selling insurance uh, from the sense I get to sell, I get to service, it's kind of problem solved. I'm my own accountant, well, not really, I sell an account, but like marketing, I'm in charge, I mean, kind of in charge of everything, advertising, marketing, you know, your own guy, your own boss, and there's not a lot of jobs like this you can still do in a relatively small town, so uh, I like it, it's fun, I have wonderful ladies that work for me uh, i've got one lady that's worked for me since i started mm -hmm. um, we kind of feel like we grew up together because we were i was 30 and she was 31 when we started um that's pretty neat um i like giving people a good place to work uh, i don't have a lot of turnover uh in my business i have you know i like to bring people in hire the right person train them up keep them for a long time uh, it's a lot less headache. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's fun. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to lay on my deathbed and say, man, I made a bunch of money or, man, I sold a bunch of insurance. But I might, you know, lay on my deathbed and say, you know, I gave some ladies a great place to work and go to work every day where they liked it and they enjoyed it and they made some money and they took their family on vacation and they bought their kids Christmas presents and all that. You know, what you do with the job. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And, you know, I've noticed that uh, a lot of successful people, they get more satisfaction out of helping others than they do themselves. And it's a big, a great benefit. Mm, I, had a, I had a consultant, sales leader, whatever you want to call him. Um, I, I started, when I started, you know, you start, you really don't know what you're doing. In anything, you're just kind of like muddling through. But about my fourth year, 2004, I really started having some success. And um, to like kind of, you know, within our, within our organization success, like we have certain awards we can get. And I started getting some of the higher awards. And, and my, my, my guy came to me, and he's a really good dude. He's, he's retired now. He had to retire because of some health issues. Um, great guy. His name's Greg Radcliffe. And Greg came to me and he said, hey, Tate, I got something I want to tell you. I said, okay. And he said, it's really going to help you. It's going to help you in your business. It's going to help you in your personal life. And I think it really helped get you to the next level. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. and I thought he was going to give me some business idea. Or something. He goes, you ready? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. And he goes, it's not about you. I'm like, okay, what's it about? And he's like, no, hear, me, hear what I'm saying. It's not about you. So, okay, who's it about? He's like, no, listen. What I'm telling you is, it's not about you. And he said, let me explain. He said, you don't need to do it for you. He said, that's two-dimensional. He said, you want your life to be three-dimensional. The one-dimensional is just doing it. What's your purpose? Doing it for, for yourself is two-dimensional. Doing it for someone else other than you. So do it for God. Do it for your family. 
do it for your employees, do it for your customers, do everything you do for someone else. Don't do it for you. You know, I kind of, kind of thought about it, but and I was only 34 at the time, but I believe him. He, he's a good dude, man. He's that kind of guy. And um, I can't tell you how many people I've passed that on to. And they all kind of look at me when I tell them those kind of things, like I kind of looked at him, you know, like, anyway. But the reality of it is, I mean, we're not put on this earth to serve ourselves. We're just not. And, um, you know, there is some satisfaction to helping others. I mean, I don't think God wants me to get up every day and go help myself. I think God wants me to get up every day and, help someone else. Now, you know, is there, do I make money here? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I do make money and it affords me a great life. And I'm happy, man. I I don't want to switch lives with anybody else on earth. I don't. I love my life. And, uh, I, you know, I hope everyone that's listening feels the same way. Um, you know, are there bad things in our life? Absolutely. But any person that you'd want to switch with, there's bad crap in their life too. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, I like, I, I can handle my bad crap right now, you know, so, um, yeah, it's been good. My education, did it help me? I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Um, back then, college was a lot cheaper, I know, because I'm putting two kids through college right now. Um, I, I, I really, I, I learned everything for this job right here that I do every day and have done for 20 years. I probably learned everything I needed to know by the time I was in sixth grade. Wow. But, well, it's just not a, I mean, when we're talking about learning, like, like, like writing math, I mean, none of the stuff I do is, but what I did learn in high school and college and even working after college is things that they're not going to teach you in school, work ethic. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to relate to people. And more so on that is not just relating to people who are relating to different types of people. Does that make sense? Like, um, you know, I've got all kinds of different clients that come in here from different socioeconomic backgrounds and I've got to be able to talk and relate to, to all of them. And, and, and I think I actually, I think I'm pretty good at that. That's one of the things. So what, what's your talent? Well, I'm, I'm, I can relate to a lot of people. I can talk to a lot of different types of people. And, and, and actually, the reason I think I can do it well is because I really enjoy it. You know, I really enjoy talking to different types of people. Mm-hmm. I think if you talk to the same person all day long every day, or the same type of person all day long every day, you'd be pretty bored with it. And, you know, I, I like trying to help people if they're young, old, wealthy, not so wealthy, you know, in a bad spot, in a good spot. I mean, I help them going back to trying to help people. So. Exactly. And what about – what about spirituality in your life? Because, I mean, that's very important to a lot of people. And I don't see, you know, the it used to be a lot more, what do you want to say, prevalent when we were younger as to right now. It's kind of been a turning away. Um, I Yeah, well, you know, what religion is dead. You know, you hear it all the time. Um, it's not dead in Carthage, Texas. <laughs> I'll tell you that. It's still... Um, you know, there's a lot. Uh, I think that, um, first of all, I think we're not completely spiritually mature until we die. So we're always becoming more spiritually mature. I, I pray every day. I have this little sheet here. And let's see. It says, do call miscellaneous and pray. And I'd like to write down. I, I do every day. Every morning when I get in, I kind of go through that. And, you know, I'll run into people through work and through just in public and say, ah, oh, you know, my mom's sick. And I'll write it down. I believe kind of in writing everything down and I'll pray for them. Um, it's a big part of my life. I'm Methodist. You know, I'm not going to. Yeah, Methodist. Uh, I say this nice. You know, we're not going to knock on your door and try to convert you. Generally, we're. <laughs> I don't know if that's not telling you that oh, oh, you know, I don't want to make you mad. But the method is generally not known for being that evangelical. But I think um, I try to live a spiritual life to show my kids what I'm supposed to do or how they're supposed to act. And, and then it's just in the community, just, you know, try to act like you're supposed to act and be a caring, giving person. And, and I think that's sometimes that's the best way to, to witness to someone. Um, 
uh, I, you know, I'm very involved in my church. I think I've held every office in my church currently. I'm chairman of our administrative board. Um, it's an important part of my life, um, especially as I get older. It's, a, it's, 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 since you just moving since moving here in the last 20 years. Yeah. It's, it's a big part of my life. And, you know, I, I'm one of those people you can rip me or whatever. Don't care. You know, I felt it was very important to the way I raised my children that every Sunday, if we're, if we're in town, we're, we're at church. You know, if you were out of town, probably not. But if we're in town, we're going to church. And my kids always ask me when they're alone, we're going to church tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't we? And, and, and my kids will even say when they come home from college now, you know, we're going to church, right? Well, yeah, I think that, that they feel like that's part of it. I think that that's um, – they feel like that's that's an important part of their life. So I don't know. That's just kind of my feeling. I know a lot of people out there might say, "Well, you don't have to go to an organized church, or you don't have to." Do that. I kind of disagree. Um, I, I'm a, I like it. I think it. I, but I like. I'm a person of habit, and I'm a person of you know. You do these things, and so every day I get up and do the same thing. And when when it's above 50 degrees every morning, I get up and I walk my dog about two and a half miles. That's what I do every day. You know, if it's above 50 degrees, I look at the weather the night before. That's what I do every day. Every day, I come in, I write myself a new one of these things. That, I mean, that just kind of a creature habit. And and I believe on Sunday mornings, we wake up, we go to church, and we go eat after church. Me and my family. You know, it's, my kids were always really busy when they were here. So one time a week that we all kind of got together and ate. And believe it or not, that theory and everything I just said is alive and well in Carthage, Texas, because <laughs> I'm, I'm not the only one doing that. And most families do that. As a matter of fact, one of the guys that called while we were sitting here on air, he's a guy I play golf with, but his family every Sunday, him and his brother and their families and their dad, their dad and mom still live here. They, go to church and they go back to the mom and dad's house and they come roast every Sunday, every Sunday. I mean, it's just like clockwork. So <laughs> I almost kind of make fun of it. Anyway. Yeah. But the, all, all those habits are a, the, a perfect formula for success. And I mean, we can both agree that that's, that's what people need to do. I mean, I'm not saying everybody's got to go to church every Sunday. It's, sure. It would be a great thing, but, um, these habits, you know, having something to believe in, it, it, it makes a big difference in your life. Well, I, I, I tell my, you know, most of the things, most of the life lessons that I try to preach is the reason they come to my mind is because I've been telling my kids. I mean, we all, as parents, we want what's best for our kids. I tell my son, my son all the time, you know, you're either spiraling up or spiraling down. I believe that. It's really hard in this world today just to stay stagnant. So either you're getting better or you're getting worse. You're constantly moving. And so I think, you know, doing things out of habit and, and trying to get better every day at everything you're doing, whether it be in a church member or a, um, and, and you're, you know, a community member, being a boss um, or a manager of people, team leader, whatever you want to call it, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. So if you're always striving to get better, you know, that's a good thing. And I try to do it every day. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, my, the ladies that work for me, they'll, they'll say, ah, oh, yeah. Because some days I come in, I'm in a great mood. I'm like, guys, man, we got to do it this way, you know. That can kind of wear them out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but constantly learning and constantly striving to be better each day. Those are yeah. certainly the keys to success. Mm -hmm. And my wife kind of, you know, I think you should be the, try to be the best at whatever you do. Try to, try to get better at whatever you do, you know, whether it's church member, civic club member, parent, husband, you know, you should always be trying to get better. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of things I would like to change. I, I mean, I, so I would like to be able to say I weigh exactly the same as I did when I graduated, but I'm like, so I probably weighed between 210 and 215 when I graduated. But right now I weighed, like this morning, I weighed 223. I, I, for some reason, I just can't get back there. I can't lose that eight pounds, and I walk every day. 
But uh, I am taller, but I would like to be able to say I weigh the same as I did when I graduated. You know, but, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know if that's going to change. So, <laughs> you know, I did write down some things. Um, I sent this girl that was graduating from college. Uh, I sent her like a little letter. She's a friend of our family's, and I kind of said, "Hey, look, here's some things to kind of work with in life, and you know, if you kind of work on these things, everything will kind of fall into place." One of them that I took from foot, playing football on Lee, I had a coach, and he would say, no matter what you do, do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, no excuses. Well, I mean, that sounds so simple, but if you do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it with no excuses, mm-hmm. a lot of the problems in your life will go away. I thought that was pretty cool. I, and I've, I've always said, for some reason, that's always stuck in my mind. Do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, no excuses. Thanks. I don't know. That worked for me most powerful coach in your life is how you talk to yourself in your head. And I tell my kids this all the time, how you're talking to yourself in your head. Like when you're walking into work and you go, Oh, today's going to suck. Well, you set yourself up for failure. If you walk in and then, man, today's going to be bad. I'm going to get so much done. You know, it's how that person in your head talks to you. It's huge. Um, this is one I tell people all the time, younger people. Never make decisions when you're mad, glad, happy, or sad. So, uh, uh, that's, you know, I see people fly off the handle, you know, or they're down in the dumps and they're making decisions. I'm like, whoa, 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 you can't make a clear decision. You got to have a clear head, you know. Um, control what you can control. and Don't let the things out of your control control you. That's big in business. You've got, I mean, we sit around and we get so – flustered and worried and upset about things that we have no control over Mm -hmm. and we spend all our time and energy on things we have no control over but yet the things that we do have absolute control over we just throw those to the side and i'm like no take that same energy that emotion that whatever and put it over here on the things you have control over get better and better better these things a lot of those things take care of themselves i like that and then this is my favorite thing that someone told me this a long time ago, and I don't really even know who told me. I wish I did because I would footnote them, credit them, the whole thing. But someone told me one time, have five good decision makers in your life and use them. And what that means is, so when I'm doing something, and it's easy to relate everything to business because there's like decisions to be made, but not even just business, personal life. Have five people in your life that you know that are really good decision makers that you look at and you go, man, that guy, doesn't seem like he makes a bad decision. And when something comes up, call those people up. Or before something comes up, call them and say, you're going to be one of my five decision makers. I'll let you know how this goes when I need you. But call them up and say, hey, look, here's what I'm thinking about. Here's what I may or may not do. What do you think? And then shut up and let them talk and let them give you their opinion. Because mm-hmm. they're out of – they're out of – they're not in the middle of the situation. They're out of it. So they can probably have – Going back to that mad, glad, happy, or sad, they can help you from a clear mind make that decision. And they're good decision making. We've already established this. So, and, and the, the reason you do this is because it's a heck of a lot easier for one person to be wrong than five. So, if you're going to do something in business, you know, hey, I, go ask these people. And if every one of them goes, oh, hey, oh, hell no, don't do that, and, and you still do it, well, that makes you a dumbass. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right. And, but but if if you go to them and you say, "Hey, here's what I'm thinking about doing. What do you think?" and they go, "Yeah, you know, that's that's, that's smart. That's smart." Um, and and you get enough of that, then you're gonna make better decisions. I think a lot of people come. I think that that's kind of a sign of being weak or ignorant or stupid or you know you're having to ask these other people. But to me. I think that's a sign of intelligence. I think that's using resources, that's using people's experiences that you haven't had yet. Right. And uh, right. I actually think it's super smart. And, and and believe it or not, there's a lot of people out there in this world that do that. And and it's a good thing. I mean, it's like I said, it's a heck of a lot easier for one person to do that. And uh, I do it every day. I have people. Yeah, and these people range from my next door neighbor who started a bank. Um, he's president of the bank next door to me, or CEO of the bank next door to me. Um, a lady that goes to my church who owns a funeral home here, and she's really good. And then I have another guy I actually was talking to about 30 minutes before we got on this. 
Uh, and then I have a friend down in Livingston, Texas, who does what I do. He's a little bit older and he's a pretty smart businessman. And I talk to him a lot. So, I mean, I, I have my five people uh, and my guy that uh, Greg did kind of told me, it's not about you. I still use him. He's one of my five. And uh, when I, I, forget, I wish I could remember who told me this, but I was kind of putting it together and I called them all and said, hey, I want you to be one of my five people. And I told them, and they all kind of laughed, but, you know, now when I pick up the phone and call them about something, they're like, oh, you know, they're kind of into it. Because someone has thought that, you know, it's kind of an honor. I mean, even if it's just me, but it's an honor for someone to say, hey, man, I think you're a really good decision maker, and I think you think things through well, and I like the way you, your brain goes, and you know, things usually work out for you, and you don't seem like you're doing things willy-nilly, and you know, I want you to be one of my five people. So that's kind of I did print off that letter I wrote that girl because when we talked about having this, I thought, well, these are things that I, I pass along to everyone or I try to pass along to everyone. Well, that's, that's awesome. That's what this show's about is, uh, you know, getting that, that perspective that has helped you become successful and passing it on to other folks. Yeah. Well, and you know, here's the thing on successful, you said successful several times and every time I kind of roll my eyes, Mm -hmm. um that's a relative term i mean what is successful i think i'm successful from the sense that i told you that i wouldn't want to change lives with anyone else mm -hmm. does that mean i have all the money in the world or have the largest stake or maybe in, in the state no i don't i don't have either of those things um i do have three kids that i love a lot and that i'm proud of i have a wife who we've been married 20 i think four years now 97 maybe 20 20 30 24 years um we've been happily married we've like most other people, we uh, get in fights and we still love each other. And, you know, we're just normal married people. And, you know, I love people think that, oh, your marriage must be perfect. You know, perfect marriage? Come on, man. I mean, two personalities living under one roof. That doesn't always work. I mean, you have your ups and downs. Um, no, but I like my job. I like my town. You know, I like my church. I'm pretty content. So when I, when I talk about success, and that's not necessarily measured in how much money you make, but uh, yeah. but it, you know achieving those things in life that that have been goals that you really want to achieve, like myself, you know I want to be a better father, I want to be a better husband, yeah. I want to be a better grandfather, and sure. you know um, the, like the podcast that that became a goal you know, just a few years ago, but I went from just barely knowing how to even get on the computer and do this to now I, I run a network and right. I edit videos and, you know, all these things that are involved and whether or not I become, you know, rich or well off, that's, that wasn't my ultimate goal. My ultimate goal was to get a message out to people Sure. and and to help others that that's yeah. that's my success right there and, well there you go yeah you know. i mean in, in in if you're like me you know there's days that you feel real successful and there's days that you don't feel so successful oh. you know mm -hmm. there's gonna be bumps in the road um i think that's just part of life i mean there's always gonna be tough times um we got all my family and in-laws coming in tonight my daughter's graduating tomorrow so you know, I got to go home. I got to deal with that. So that's not going to be some ideal <laughs> weekend. But I mean, I love them all, but, you know, they're all under your roof and got to make them happy, I guess. Right. Cook dinner. And, I'll have you know. to say, I'm, I'm so glad yeah. that I got all the uh, graduating and all that stuff over and done with years ago. Um, my baby's 24. So yeah. uh, <laughs> now, yeah. now I'm grandpa. I'm Paul another Paul. Whole, whole other dynamic in the relationship there. Grandparents are great. I mean, you can do whatever you want. And you don't have to worry about the results, you know. So. <laughs> anyway. um, well, I, hey, man, I, yeah, I have to go to a meeting here a little bit, but um, hey, that's part I of really it, man. I mean, I'm honored that you asked me to do this. I don't, I mean, I don't know how many people are watching or what. But even if it's just you and me, I'm glad we got to catch up and talk and. You know, I'm never going to 
not want to talk about positive things and being better. You know, it's kind of what we need to do every day, all of us. And so, you know, I, I appreciate you you doing this. Oh, man, I appreciate you being on. Now, quick, before you uh, leave, uh, sure. your your insurance, now, do you, do you like, cover all of Texas, or is it just uh, – Yeah, just stay in Texas, yeah. Okay. So, Anywhere in state of Texas, yeah, absolutely. If, if anyone wants to – if anybody wants to uh, – it needs some help with insurance, or just a question, man. I mean, I, I get more business out of just helping people answer their questions. Sometimes they get in a situation where they don't really understand what's going on, and it's yeah. all I've ever done for, like, 25 years. And uh, even before I was an agent, I, I did auto injury claims with State Farm, and I did underwriting for commercial properties for State Farm. So I've got a pretty good background in insurance, and, and I understand it. And so if you ever have a question, feel free to call me. I'll be, I'll be happy to help you. And it's um, Tate, TateBarber.com is, is my email, and my website's www.TateBarber.com. Pretty easy to remember. But, um, yeah, if anybody ever needs anything, give me a call. I'll be happy to help you out. And so what's your phone number? Oh nine oh three seven five four one six six one is my cell phone number. But I'm not trying to pitch anything. Um, you know, if but if anyone ever does get in a situation where they don't understand something about their insurance, which is most people, you know, you pay your bill every month and you really don't know what you have. I found out there's a lot of that, and and I'm kind of the same way on other things. You know, I pay for my like satellite bill every month. I have no idea what I'm paying for. You know, I just pay it. Well, that's stupid. You know, you need to call them about once a year and ask them, what am I paying for? And have them explain it to you. Same thing goes for your insurance. You need to know what you're paying for. So, anyway. Um, well, I have to say this has been informative, and uh, I appreciate everyone that listens. And, you know, stay tuned. There will be more okay. to come. So, so let me ask you a question because I don't know. I'm asking, where – do we download the podcast? I mean, like, so you just get on like a, a, a podcast store. Like I, I've listened to some other ones. What, uh, what What's it under? Uh, the Vibe? Uh, it's under the Vibes Broadcast Network. Uh, you will okay. find that there's uh, this show is listened to the Vibes, and we have several different listed under there. So whenever <laughs> you pull it up, it does pull up a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, we're on just about every platform you can think of, iHeartRadio, <laughs> Spotify, um, this mm -hmm. will also be edited and put on YouTube. Um, okay. So, yeah. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network and on Instagram at The Vibes Broadcast. <laughs> <laughs>